Amen and amen. If you're not aware, that Ode 26 was written about 800 AD. That hymn's 1300 years old. But it didn't change his message. The message is amen. the same message they had that we have, that all future generations will have. It's amazing. So, amen. So, good morning, brothers and sisters. I have the privilege of reading you. Some great and amazing pieces of scripture this morning. Um, three different sections Matthew 3, 1 through 12, Revelation 2, 1 through 7, Acts 2, 37 through 41, which you can find on the page notations on the screen here. And if you would stand for the reading of God's Word. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is come. This is he who has spoken through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair. And he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. When we saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers! Who warned you to flee the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones God could raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the tree. And every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me comes one who's more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear his threshing floor, <coughs> gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. To the church in Ephesus, I'm sorry, to the angel in the church of Ephesus, write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lapstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them liars. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practice of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has hear, ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? 
Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, because of the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord God will call. With many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them, be saved from this corrupt generation. Those who received his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. And God bless the reading his word to your soul. You may be seated. there as it relates to uh, repentance, the gift of repentance. We're continuing our series. Uh, we began how to live the Christian life for the glory of God alone and uh, confession of sin. Last week we looked at continual confession of sin um, and this week continual repentance of sin. Two of the means that God's given us uh, for living the Christian life, the two go hand in glove together. The title of the message is God's Provision for Living the Christian Life, Part 2. And the essential idea is repentance is to be continued throughout the believer's life. That's evidence of being a saved man, woman, youth, or child. And as we look at this, we'll see that where there is repentance, there's a deep conviction of sin. And that's initially when someone's saved, and that's throughout the life of the child of God, who is saved, a deep conviction of sin, a desperation for deliverance from sin. Remember Paul said, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God who gives me the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a saved man crying out in repentance to God. So there's a desperation and then a desire to obey God. What shall I do? What should I do? How should I respond? So Lord Jesus, thank you, thank you, thank you for uh, uh, these two, confession and repentance. And um, just for the uh, gift of repentance, the gift of continual repentance, crying out to you that we would bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And we just thank you and praise you, Lord. Guide us, direct us, lead us as we look at these scriptures, as we look at these illustrations. Uh, may the glory of God be seen in a deeper way in the repentance of his people. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, as uh, and there's just so many different scriptures that we could read about as it relates to repentance. And our anchor is kind of the last verses that Brother John read, Acts 2, 37 through 41. <clears throat> could have gone... 1 through 47 this morning of Acts chapter 2, or certainly 22 through 47, we could have gone. Um, but I wanted us to hear the Matthew verses and the Revelation verses also as it relates to um, repentance. And this, in Acts 2, is really the first Christian sermon. It's uh, Peter's preaching at Pentecost, after Pentecost, after the gift of the Holy Spirit came upon the believers there. This is the first uh, sermon, Christian sermon, really, and you see the response to it. And I was thinking when Brother John was reading the verses in Revelation 2, which is uh, a warning to the church. Uh, there's the, the, the letters there that are warnings to the church, and in each one of the letters there's a accommodation to the church, and also a warning, and the warning there in Revelation 2 that Brother John read was, you know, repent, do the deeds you did at first, or else I'm going to come and remove your lampstand. Uh, the, the, the light of the church would be eliminated from the community, so to speak. But just that part about repent and do the deeds you did at first, it's just a call to repentance in the life of a child of God. Repent, return to your first love, when you uh, initially were saved, and, and all that, that meant, and repent. Alright, a deep conviction of sin is seen here in verse 37. A deep conviction of sin 
in saving somebody when they recognize that they've sinned, and really even more a deep conviction of sin when we sin now in the present as believers of, in God. Not only heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, what shall we do? What a great question. What a great challenge for how to live the Christian life. What a great response. What shall we do when we're convicted of our sin or we recognize sin in some area of our life as we go through our day? When they heard this, this is again in response to the previous verses, um, especially verses 22 through 36, they heard the first, really, well, the first gospel presentations in Genesis, but they heard the first preaching of the gospel, right, after Jesus was resurrected from the dead, ascended at the right hand of the Father, and basically, you know, you read Acts chapters 2, you've read it, you know this, we've done studies on Acts in various different ways, and you've read the book of Acts. Really, Peter's telling them, you're responsible for Jesus' death, right? You know that. You're responsible. He was the Savior. He was the Messiah. He was the Son of God. He was the Lamb who came to take away the sins of the world, and you, at the hands of sinful men, put him to death. Put him on that cross. You're responsible for his death, and obviously we know each one of us are responsible for his death. The unsaved person before they'll ever be saved, needs to be responsible that they are the ones guilty, as we all are, of sin. And then their response would be, what must I do to be saved? Their eyes and their attention and their focus will be taken off of themselves and on to what shall we do to be saved? Brethren, what shall we do? When they heard this, it said they were pierced to the heart. It's like, you know, you're like being stabbed in the heart. And look at verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you've crucified. Can you imagine hearing those words? I mean, we'd be like, Isaiah 6, Woe is me, for I am undone. There is no hope. That's the beautiful thing about the gospel. There's the great hope that we have in God through Jesus Christ. Imagine they're, they're, they're pierced to the heart, they're, they're stabbed. That word pierce appears only here in the New Testament. Something sudden and unexpected stabbed them in the heart. It describes the pain associated with great anxiety and remorse over what's stabbing them in the heart, the news that they heard. And, and you can imagine the hopeless. I'd be like, well, okay, I'm done, like Isaiah said. I'm there's no hope now. We killed the Messiah. We killed the Savior. Verses 22 through 24. And, and, and do read all of Acts 2 today. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus, the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God prepared, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. And here, of course, is the main, here is the key. This man was delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. God's plan, God's means of providing redemption and forgiveness from sin for all those who would trust in him. God's plan for providing redemption. You nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. I always love the but gods in the Bible. But God raised him up again, putting an agony, put an end to the agony of the death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. Brethren, what shall we do is the blessed response of the unsaved person in coming to Christ. Brethren, God, what shall we do is the blessed response when there's a deep conviction of sin in our own life. When you ever say something, no, no one's ever done that. You say something and it's like, ah, Get those words, put those words back in there. Why did I say that, right? When there is that deep conviction of sin, followed by, then it's followed by a believer. Confession. God is faithful and just and forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We saw that last week. And then there's repentance. Lord, help me by the power of your spirit. 
to repent, to turn from this sin. Help me, Lord. And then there's lots of means of God's grace to help us with that. Especially the scripture, you got anger issues, scripture. You got control issues, the scripture. You got anxiety issues, the scripture. You got self issues, the scripture. Reading the word, meditating on the word, praying the word, surrounding ourselves with godly counsel, brothers and sisters in Christ who will come alongside us and um, not massage our sin. Or, or, or tell us, oh yeah, that's so bad that that happened to you, you shouldn't have. But they'll, they'll help us to move toward confession and repentance toward Christ. I want to hear a great, we're talking about ortho, praxi, how to live, the Christian life, and what does it look like. And so here's a great illustration of that. Actually, it's in Acts chapter 7. It's in verse 54. And it's the same initial response to the very same news. And Acts chapter 7 is um, Stephen's defense. Right? You've read that before. Stephen's defense uh, as they're about ready to stone him and Saul of all people is you know, holding the coats while they're going to stone, stone the man to death. And he's telling them basically the same thing that is recorded here in Acts about how Jesus came, how Jesus suffered, and how Jesus died, and how they were responsible for his death. And they put him to death, and, but he, he's alive, he's the Savior, he's Lord. And basically, the same, the gospel message goes forth there, just as it went forth there in Acts chapter 2. And in Acts chapter 7, verse 54, is the same initial response. When they heard the news, the very same news, about what happened to Jesus, it says they were cut to the quick. They were stabbed to the heart. They were pierced in their soul over that news that happened. And instead of asking, what shall we do? And instead of hearing the message of repentance and turning and repenting, they hear the news about this Jesus saving, being the Savior and Lord. And they're gnashing their teeth at him, Stephen, and rejecting Stephen, but ultimately rejecting Christ, ultimately rejecting the gospel. And then they go on here to stone Stephen. So that's really the two responses, ultimately, to Jesus of the unbeliever. Really, there's the cut to the quick, what must I do to be saved? Or there's, I want this Jesus, gnashing of teeth, anger, hatred. So because repentance is to be continued throughout the life of believers, we see that um, deep conviction of sin. And then it's, it's back in verse 37 with the question, brethren, what shall we do? There's a desperation for deliverance from sin. Brethren, what shall we do? They sought eagerly to make right what <laughs> they could for what they had done and to um, avoid the wrath of God and the wrath of uh, Messiah. And through the Holy Spirit's powerful preaching, through Peter's powerful preaching, through the inspiration of the Spirit, they get to this point of desperation. And we should be equally at that point of desperation in our sin. We're not Acts, we're not Romans chapter 6 people, right? For goodness sakes. No way. We're not Romans 6 people, right? Oh, what shall we do then so that you know grace may abound? Well, we just continue in sin. I used that illustration once before. Somebody talking to me and telling me that they knew they were living in that sin and they're not going to give up that sin and they're just going to rely upon God's grace. Literally, that person is saying, well, you know, I'm just going to hope and pray that the grace of God will abound even though I know I'm convicted. They were convicted of what they were doing and they said, I'm not going to repent. I mean, that's just folly. That's just nonsense. That's just... So we're not Romans 6 people in that sense, right? What, you know, well, grace will just abound. Oh, well, you know, I can't help it. I can't change. Oh, well, that's just it. I'm saved, but you know what? God understands. And No, there's a, there's a conviction of sin. There's a desperation for deliverance of sin. We want to be Romans, in this sense, Romans 7 people, right? Where I already shared that illustration. I share it all the time. Where Paul's like, who's going to deliver me from this body of death? I'm doing the very thing I hate, right? We go over that all the time. 
Thanks be to God who gives me the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we want to be like David, like we read, like we read last week, when he's convicted and caught, convicted over his sin. He's like, yeah. The prophet tells him, you're the man. And he's like, I'm undone too. I'm broken. Lord, please forgive me. Great, great illustration. Verse 38 after verse 37. So we got, brethren, what shall we do? There's a desperation to be delivered from sin. And Peter says to them, repent. I think Brother John, when he was praying in the beginning, or he was reading something, I think he said, I think he made reference to the verse that says, repent or perish. And um, I remember another church that I was at, um, and I've only been at three as a saved person, so if you know which ones I've been at, you could you know, say, well, it's either that one or that one. It wasn't this one, per se. Um, where uh, this, this person, this lady in the congregation, heard that passage. We were talking about it in a meeting or something, and repent or perish. She hated it. She goes, that's terrible. Repent or perish? Wow, that's just, you know, real strong. That's really just, you know, not loving. That's just really... Uh, not going to attract anybody. I, I don't know what her problem was with repent or perish, except her problem was she didn't understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. So he says here, repent. Each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sin. Repent. Peter says to them, repent. We know what repentance means. We're heading in one direction. We turn. We turn to Christ. We, try to, we, we seek to turn away from the sin. We seek to, Lord, help us. We read the verse of Matthew 3, 8. Help me, Lord, to bear fruit in keeping with repentance in this very area where there's a, a conviction of sin. Help me to repent. Help me to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Help, I pray, Lord, that my spirit will bear witness with your spirit in this area that I belong to you. That's in Romans 8, somewhere around 18. So you got classic example of uh, lots of classic examples. Orthopraxis. What's this look like? How do I do it? Illustrations in the Bible about repentance. We read one already. Um, before I read the two contrasts between godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. Godly sorrow leads to salvation, forgiveness of sin, intimacy with God, salvation. Worldly sorrow right? And produces death. And so you know the illustration of those two, right? Who are the two people in the Bible that are illustrations of? One's got godly sorrow, one's got worldly sorrow. That would be Peter, and that would be Judas. But before we look at the illustration, Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, I'll start with verse 8, for though I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I see that the letter caused you sorrow, though only for a little while. I now rejoice that you were made sorrowful. Repent or perish. But that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. For the sorrow that is, that is according to the will of God. So you want to know the will of God? You want to know how to live the Christian life? Oh, well, God, what's your will in this situation? What's your will for my life? Here's the will of God for the life of a believer. For the will of God produces repentance. So the will of God for our life is repentance. How do I, how do I live the Christian Repentance. For the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world leads death, leads to death. So I have to be careful with some of the illustrations that I give. One time some of my family goes, Dad, you know they knew that you were talking about us. One of the three, like, yeah. I go, okay, so I'm not going to do that anymore, okay? But you know, like in general, okay, this is not, this is in general the illustration. In general, the illustration. Anybody that's had kids knows in general the illustration that the child is sorry that they got caught. Or 
sorry for the consequences that will come, but not godly sorrow often enough that produces repentance, right? So Peter and, Matt and um, Judas, the illustration here of this. I don't, have to, I don't have to even look at it, I'll read it, but I will. Matthew 26, you got Peter first of all. And Peter had been told, you're going to deny me, and you're going to deny me, and after you have been, and I, but I prayed for you, that was a big, one of the big differences between the two. I have prayed for you, Jesus said to Peter, that after you have come to your senses, after it's been revealed to you that, yeah, you've sinned in this area because I'm praying, I'm praying for you, then after that happens, go and strengthen your brothers. And so Peter says, and, and he denied it with an oath, I don't know the man. A little while, the bystander came up and said to Peter, surely you are one of them, for even the way you talk gives you away. Then he began to curse and swear, I don't know the man. And immediately a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the word which Jesus had said, before a rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. And we know that those were the weeping of, of tears of repentance. And we know because of what happened in Peter's life after that, right? And, and how he responded afterwards. And then you have the other illustration. That's the godly sorrow, then the worldly sorrow. Judas, who had betrayed him. I mean, they both. One denied him, one betrayed him. Saw that he had been condemned. He felt remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I've sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, what is that to us? See to it yourselves. And he threw the pieces of silver into the temple sanctuary and departed and went away and hanged himself. So really an illustration there of worldly sorrow that ultimately produced death. And ultimately, worldly sorrow produces eternal death and eternal damnation. You've heard stories of people, you know, those... I won't use that illustration. You've heard, you've heard illustrations, you've seen illustrations of worldly sorrow over getting caught versus... Godly sorrow turns to Christ. Godly sorrow turns in repentance to Jesus. Godly sorrow produces life. Okay. Verse 36 says, or 38 says, And let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, which came at Pentecost, when the disciples, at the preaching of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came. Holy Spirit being now, the, is, so he has been the living presence of God. It's, it's Jesus Christ dwelling in us. He said, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to now live in you, be with you, and be in you. I'm going to die. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to come back. I'm going to be raised. And then I'm going to be ascended. And in Acts 2, he says, then, then in Acts 1, he's the ascension. And then he had told him in John 14 and 16, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit now to be with you permanently, to indwell you. I love that. I am with you always even to the end of the age, even until the end of time. His presence indwelling us, the living presence of Jesus Christ, indwelling us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And he says to them, you will receive the Spirit, you will be, and it will be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Be baptized. Which is why we do baptism by immersion here um, in our church. Brother John, we've said this before, and at some point we're going to share maybe some more of these direct illustrations or direct different things of the history of this church. That is now, this church is 100, and, this church is now 130 years old. This is the year that it's 130 years old. Started in Waterbury, came here in 55, and um, God has not chosen to remove the lampstand throughout this church, even through some tumultuous 70s, 80s, 90s, and um, early 2000s, still some trials and tribulations. He's chosen not to remove the lampstand. And so we're, we're reading, and I've shared this before, just different aspects of the history of this church and 
All the way back. What year are you now? Uh, 1917. So 1917. Looking at minutes and looking at historical documents as it relates to this church. So we're going to share more about that probably in the new year. We're going to share more about that as we, you know, move uh, move forward as a church. It's good to remember, like the foundation of our church and of our, I mean, our, our authority is the Word of God and the relationship with Jesus Christ. But it's good it's good to remember that the richness of our history as a church, as a Baptist church. Again, we emphasize, please. I've been brought up in denomination. We emphasize we're Baptist in, in teaching, in, in, in doctrine, in, in belief. But our emphasis is on the scripture, is on Jesus Christ, is on our relationship with him. So we'll share some of that stuff uh, as we move forward. So they're baptized in the name of Jesus. And you know that that, that isn't what saved them, but that's a gift. Imagine then, when they were baptized in the name of Jesus and made a public profession and testimony of faith in Jesus Christ, it could mean... Then they were hunting, you know, just before that, they were hunting down the disciples. And the very Peter, imagine, in the very Peter who denied him three times and was afraid at the courtyard of the servant girl. Now they're the most outspoken. You read Acts, it's like, what must... They were like, we can't stop talking about Jesus. You throw us in prison, whatever you... We can't help but talk about what... We see him. He's alive. He rose from the dead. He appeared to us and to over five... We were there in the upper room. Thomas didn't believe, but he showed him the finger, the prints, the, 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 the wounds. We're not gonna we're not gonna stop talking about this Jesus. The Jesus is the one who saves. So when there's repentance, and it's to be continued throughout the life of the believer, there's a desperation for deliverance. We need more. I think we need more of a desperation of deliverance from sin. Yes, you know, we're saved and we, we, we thank and praise God that he saved us from our sins, that we have eternal life. But a greater sense of, this is sanctification, this is growing in Christ-likeness and holiness. Wanting to be, uh, to grow in holiness and to be delivered from our sins. We know we're not going to be there until perfected until we're in Christ's presence. We're certainly not going to stay and be in Romans 6. We certainly want to be in Romans 7 and then into Romans Eight, that's the victory. Romans 8 has the victory of the life of a believer in Christ. He says this gift of the Holy Spirit is for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off as many wow there's such good stuff here as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. You see who this promise is for here? This promise of the Holy Spirit, the living presence of Jesus, enjoying them. The promise of forgiveness, the gift of repentance. See, it's for those who are, where? Far off. Far off. Good illustration of that. I think I'm going to read a couple of minutes. It's the prodigal was far off. Prodigal son. Those who are far off. Those, those who are not, you know, good at heart and they got a good heart and they're probably pretty good and, you know, they just need Jesus, but they're, 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 they're not, but they're, they're, they're good by nature. They're, they're, they're pretty good people. No, these are people. The unsaved person is a far off, is far away, is, look, living in their trespasses and sins and loving it and not wanting to come to the light because they're ashamed of their deeds of dark, of their deeds of dark that are being done in the darkness, and they will not come to the light unless they're convicted of their sin and their eyes and their heart are the veil is taken off of their heart, and then it'll be what must I do to be saved? The focus will go in a healthy sense off of themselves. Wow, I'm undone. Wow. What must I they'll 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 see their far offness. And they'll want to turn to him because he's called them. So do you see who will be saved there in verse 39? No getting around it. As many as the Lord our God will call to himself. Joan, come here! Yes. Joan, come here! Joan, come here! Now, if she could, if she was, you know, she'd jump up and say, yes, come here. She, she'd jump right up and she, yeah, she said yes, right? Yes. She said yes! 
That's the, that's the illustration. When the call goes out to the person that's the believer, the one that's being convicted, the one who's veiled, the veil, they're like, yeah? Yeah? What? What do you want? What do you want me to do? Versus the unsaved person that's like calling to, what is it? They're a corpse. They're dead men walking in women, dead men, women, children, walking in their sin. They're, they can't hear it. Until God removes the veil, opens, up, opens their ears, and they come. And that's what this says. As many as the Lord God will call to himself will come. Matthew 22, verse 14, says it a little differently. But it's the same principle. For many are called. Goes out to everybody. Many are called. I don't know who's chosen. You don't know who's chosen. Hopefully you know you're, you've been chosen. See, these doctrines of uh, election and these doctrines of perseverance of saints and these doctrines of grace and these doctrines that, 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 that we looked at in the Baptist Confession of 1689, these are to... You're not going to go to your unsaved sister or child or grandmother or grandfather and say, I don't know, I guess you're not chosen. No, these, these doctrines are for us to grow in our understanding and appreciation of who we are as children of God, how we've been saved, who saved us, who initiated the action, who holds us and keeps us safe. It's, it's for us to grow in grateful appreciation of the fact that we are His and that we have been saved. Many are called, but few are chosen. Those who are called will come to Christ because they've been chosen by Christ. Verse 40 says, back in Acts chapter 7, I can feel the heat's come up now in the room. Not because of the preaching, because of the heat in the room. The heat in the room. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. There's application there. What, you know, how do we live the Christian? What must we do in response to the message of repentance? We share this message with people. We encourage them. It says they solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them. So in whatever way you can, in whatever their circle of influence is, and however, what words you do, what actions you use, what prayers you pray, the goal is encouraging the unsaved or the not yet believer to be saved from this perverse generation. And you don't have to go, you're not going to go up to them and go, you're just perverse, you're just horrible. You want them to see their sin, but you, you know, you know what I'm saying? You've got to use, you know, the right kind of actions and the right kinds of words with, with, with people um, to help them to see their sin and their need to be saved. A great illustration of this as it relates to what we're called to do, how to live the Christian life. Again, because repentance is to be continued. It's a continual repentance. It's, it's living a life of repentance. Luke chapter 24, verses 44 through 47. I love this. This is one of his appearances after this resurrection. These are words which I spoke to you while I was still with you. This is after he's revealing himself to them. He says, and then it says, they, they, then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed to his name, in his name to all the nations, beginning with Jerusalem, from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Those are our marching orders. That's our great commission. Repentance, the gift of repentance, continued throughout the life of a believer. It's the means of one of the means of grace that He's given to us. There's a deep conviction of sin. There's a desperation for deliverance from sin and an increasing desire to obey God. And I think the more, the, the longer we're walking with the Lord as we're growing in Christ, that desire to obey Him intensifies, I guess I could say. Verse 41 says, So that those, so here's the obedience of them, those initially 
those who have received his word. See, that's what we receive. We're wanting to receive the word, being doers of the word, not hearers only. Those who received his word were baptized. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And you want to see what repentance looked like there, read 42 through 47 in the life of the early church. The word received meant they received it with delight. Imagine the delight. What shall I do? I'm undone. There's no hope. Repent and be baptized and believe in the name of the Lord Jesus. You'll be saved. You'll be forgiven. It means they embrace what he said with, heart, with, with, with uh, heartfelt appreciation. No, there was no gnashing of teeth. There was, there was thank God, there's, there's, there's hope for me. And they showed their readiness to obey God. And 3,000 souls were added that day. How were they added? At the preaching of repentance, they were added that day. So we've looked at some orthopraxy kind of illustrations and we're just going to hit a couple other points here, pointed illustrations. How do I do this? How do I live the Christian life? How do I offer continual repentance to God? How do I respond to God's provision of repentance of sin for living the Christian life? Well, here again, the first and foremost one has to be issued to the not yet believer has to be issued to the unsaved person to repent by turning to Christ, by turning to Christ in repentance for the forgiveness of your sin. Not yet believer sitting here, not yet believer watching this video, or I don't know, they don't call it a video, whatever it's called. 2 Peter 3 9. Peter. I don't know him. I don't know him. I don't know the man. I'm afraid of that serving girl. She's telling, she's blowing my cover. She, she heard my accent. She, she figures I'm a Galilean. You were with Jesus. He says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, he says, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness. Ugh, how do I live the Christian life? Lord, help me. It says, but he's patient toward you. Fruit of the Spirit, we gotta do one of, we gotta show that other fruit of the Spirit at some point. Patience is one of them. So could we say that believers in Jesus Christ, those who have been saved, those who have been, uh, been, uh, been, uh, have given, been given the Holy Spirit, we ought to be the most patient people on the planet. We ought to be the most loving. We ought to be the most Amen. forgiving. We ought to be the Lord Amen. most merciful. We ought to be the most all of it. Faith, Amen. faith, all of it. The Lord is not slow about his promise of some counsel, but is patient toward you, not yet believer, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And then in Mark chapter 1, Now, after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God and saying to them, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent! Repent! And believe in the gospel. And those are the two twin things that repent and believe go together. Repent and believe go together. Uh, you see that in the book of Acts. How do we do it? How do we live the Christian life? How, how can we offer a continual repentance? How? How do we do it? By the grace of God and through the, through the help of the presence of the Holy Spirit and by repenting. Just like, how do we do that? By confessing our sin. By repenting of our sin. When there's a conviction. I'm the man. Yes. I'm the one. Help me, Lord. Forgive me. Help me to repent. Not, I'm going to do the blame thing. I heard a thing this past week. We were meeting with somebody, Brother John, and we were going through, Brother John was leading us through Rome, uh, Genesis chapter 3. I wish we recorded that video. It was just an anointed sharing of what was going on in Genesis chapter 3 with the first sin and their hiding and what God had done in his provision. Uh, so we, we, we want to, we don't want to hide, right? We want to repent. 
Brother Red, Brother John read Matthew 3. I'll just hit this really quick, a couple of verses, 1 through 3. Now in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then in verse 7, in the Sadducees and the Pharisees, he warned them, saying, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Verse 8, tucked right there. Therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. How do we repent? How do we? It's to be continual. By bearing fruit in keeping with repentance. Help us, Lord, to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. I was reading, I think, yeah, it was this morning, John chapter 15, about abiding in Christ, and as a vine abides in the Christ. How do we live the Christian life is right there in John. It's all over the scriptures, right there in John chapter 15, 1 through 11, through our abiding in Christ. How do we live through, how do we by abiding in Christ? Lord, help us to offer continual repentance to you because it goes from sin, self, me, 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 to ah, forgiveness, fruit, repentance, drawing close, and then we're drawing closer to God. We grow in intimacy with God through the gift of God's grace of confession and repentance. Job, um, <laughs> Job, Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things, verse four, chapter 42, and that no purpose of yours could be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I declare that which I do not understand, things too wonderful to me which I do not know. You know, he was saying some things, and at one point he's like, all right, I'll... at one point he's like, I'm just going to be quiet and listen. Hear now, verse 4, and I will speak. I will ask you, and you will instruct me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I retract and I repent in dust and ashes. And, and, and so there's a continual repentance. And it's not, I said this somewhere where I was this week, it's not beating yourself with chains and whips, you know, like, like some, I don't know who does that. But, but, it's, but it's repentance, and it's glad repentance, and it's, and it turns to Christ, and then there's the freedom and the blessing of walking in greater intimacy with the Lord. So that's why there's repentance. And then Paul, Paul is a great illustration of the scripture of you know, how to and who did it and how do we repent. And Paul, he recognized, you know, the sin. He was said he was the chief of sinners. He was responsible. He's holding the coat. Of the people that are going to stone Stephen to death. And in 1 Timothy 1, 12 through 15, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy. Who ought to be the most merciful people on the planet? Christians. With our spouses, with our children, with our with our circles of influence with our boss, with our, if, or our employee, or whatever. And you have to be merciful when they're not, someone's doing something and you're not worth, they're not deserving of the mercy. All right. I acted eagerly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It's a trustworthy statement, he says, deserving full acceptance that Christ came in the world to save sinners, of whom I am foremost of all, or chief. And the grace of repentance seen there. And then in Galatians chapter 1, Paul again, wow, Lord, help us. It's a be continual repentance through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And it's to be Offer to you, Lord, in the moment of the sin, in the moment of the conviction. We own it, we accept it, we confess it, we repent. We don't blame, we don't hide, we don't run, we don't we don't go do the Jonah, the Jonah thing and go run away. Galatians chapter 1, verse 23. But only they kept hearing, he who persecuted us is not preaching. Here's repentance. He who persecuted us is not preaching the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they were glorifying God because of me. Repentance glorifies God. And then the last illustration for the moment is in Luke chapter 15. In the picture of repentance. 
in Luke chapter 15, verse 17 to 24, the prodigal. And what God's response is to the, to, to the son who comes back. This is always God's response to his children when there's confession and when there's repentance. But when he came to his senses, the prodigal came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I'm dying here with hunger. I'll get up and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as your hired men. So he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, he loved the illustration, don't you? This is the picture of the father looking outside of that window with outstretched arm at the top of Memorial Hill Drive there. Where is he? He's, he's going to come back. My son is going to come back. Is that him? At the top of the road, coming down the road? He was still a long way off. His father saw him. Who ought to be the most compassionate people on the planet? This is repentance. This is how you live the Christian life. Who ought to be the most compassionate people on the planet with your in-laws and your outlaws and whomever else? And he ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Now what's going to happen? That's going to be it. I'm going to be struck down dead. I'm not, no, there's no hope for me. Now what's going to happen when I confess and I repent and I run to my father? What is going to happen to me? What is he going to do to me? The father said to his slaves, quickly bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring in his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fat and calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate for the son of mine was dead and has come to life again. Amen. He was lost and he's been found and they began to celebrate. Wow. And there's joy in heaven over when one sinner turns to Christ and to say repentance to be continued throughout the believer's life. Because of that we see in these verses and in the life of you and the life of me and the life of true believers in Christ a deep conviction of sin. A desperation for deliverance from sin. A desire to obey God. In the orthopraxis challenge for the week. Help us Lord to practice the continual repentance of sin to you for the glory of God alone. And it's said there in Revelation chapter 2 about you know, repent. Do the deeds you did at first. Repent. And then there's two quotes because it's, they're awesome quotes. Both of them. Martin Luther. When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, Repent, He willed that the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. Did you love that? And Charles Spurgeon said, Since repentance is continual, believers repent until their dying day. This dropping well is not intermittent. And it said in Matthew 3, Help us, Lord, help us to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. So Jesus, we just thank you and praise you for the beauty of the gospel message, for the beauty of the doctrine of repentance and these two twins' confession and repentance as two graces that give us the means by which to live the Christian life. Help us to live a life of continual repentance toward you. In those moments, when it's an opportunity to exercise love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, self-control, help us to live out the Christian life by being a people demonstrating that they have um, received the Lord and be repentant in those areas. And when we're not loving, joyful, peaceful, patient, kind, gentle, exhibiting self-control, is to confess. Help us to ask the Lord. Help us to stop doing the very thing we hate. Help us to run to the throne of grace. Run to the throne of grace, remembering what the prodigal did and remembering what your response is when we respond to you that way. For the glory of God alone we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.